with that life you learn there's no honor amongst thieves no it's not these people are like leeches he said when you've got nothing or you've got nothing to offer them you're no good to anyone and did you find you became one of them i think you become ruthless cold-hearted yeah. the lifestyle what, what would push me over to do those things mm. dodge mm. i didn't really want to do those things i did know the right right between right and wrong mm. and that's when i realized crime for me don't pay yeah. crime might have paid for my dad but it didn't pay for me was there something inside? Were oh, you I was born? born? I was born naughty and yeah. I died naughty. I was working with a big, big syndicate and you had arm robbers there, drug dealers there, drug barons there. Yeah. The hierarchy of the South, East London, underworld. Did you know that you were fully protected? The fallback would be you use your old man's surname. We'll Listen, back, my okay. dad's best friends were like Eddie Charlie Richardson, uh, Ronnie Olive. Hey, these people run London. Yeah. Then I started realising these people aren't aren't friends of mine. They, they would turn you over, they would listen. They would, I saw them slipping off with each other's girlfriends and wives if they could. And if these people could do that to their own wives and, girl, and friends' girlfriends, mm. what could they do to their friends? Jimmy, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Dodge. I'm uh, really looking forward to this one. Good. Um, let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up? And what was it like being the son of a gangster? Uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, Lewisham, South East London, SE13. Uh, predominantly now one of the biggest gang areas in London. Uh, but no, it was... Uh, growing up, I grew up uh, on a place called the Ferrier Estate, which was one of the the first biggest council estates in, in, in London. And uh, it was like a high-rise place. But no, it was uh, Jim Davidson, the comedian, was our next-door neighbour. And I went to, but funny enough, I went to a private school there. But my mum my mum was a lot younger than my dad. So she always had aspirations for bigger things. Mm. And she pushed my dad. He was like a nightclub owner. And um, they got their first nightclub in Kent. And we moved over to Kent, a nice little three-bedroom semi in the late 70s. Mm. And obviously, my, but my, my roots were growing up in Lewisham. So I always went back there on a Saturday and mm. my dad had Spielers, which were like illegal gambling clubs. Yeah. So I'd go back there on a, on a Saturday morning with my dad and watching all the gangsters around South London play cards, Kaluki, poker. Yeah. That was interesting. And what was it like for you? Did you know you were did you know you were in that sort of like family no, at the time? No. No. Uh, the only thing I knew is obviously six weeks before I was born, which was in lot lot more gangster books, my uncle, who was with my dad's sister, Freddie Saul, he shot and killed a high ranking uh, Chief, Chief Superintendent uh, Richardson in mm. Blackpool on a bodged arm robbery. So at the time of me being born at the hospital, the police were raiding the hospital <laughs> looking for my uncle, who was like Britain's most wanted man. Yeah. And obviously he later he got he later got a uh, life imprisonment and served 32 years, come out and is now a multimillionaire, got over COVID, and he's 89 years old, still selling cars. Is he still at it? Yeah, is still he? at it, is selling he? cars. Yeah, yeah so no, he's, no, so he's, he's turned his life around. Yeah. As I said, he's, he, he didn't go out that day intending to shoot the police officer. Yeah. He didn't, he, he, he's not an evil man, he's, yeah. he's, he's a normal person. Yeah. But it was just that day, uh, he went out, he, he, he was skint, someone let him down for a bit of money. He went on a bit of work, which he didn't really normally do. And it happened and the, the, the copper jumped onto the gun and he pulled the trigger. Hell. So it's just amazing how one thing in someone's life yeah. can change. Yeah. And what was your upbringing like then? You said you obviously, your old, <coughs> your old man was a, a proper face back in the what, 60s, yeah. 70s, 80s. Well, he was a famous boxer in the 40s and 50s. Mm. He turned pro uh, 16 years old, younger. He changed his date of birth, which you could do then. It weren't yeah. like all like it is now. And he won his first 20 professional fights. Won, I think, 16, knock, 16 knockouts in, in the first 16 fights. Mm. Done really, really well. But then he went crooked under Mickey Duff on his 21st fight. Mm. He said, son, I weren't earning the money. And it wasn't like today, he'd have been given title shots at that, yeah. like those fights. But no, he, he sort of, uh, he went crooked because he was taking Joan Collins out on a date. Was he? <laughs> and he was going, to, so Richard Attenborough <laughs> was his friend. Yeah, Because okay. obviously my dad's friends all around that era were like Bernie Eccleson. Yeah. Fam and like um, Alex Ferguson. So a lot of my dad's friends were like very, he was like, my dad was like similar to like, not in the same class, but David, like the David Beckham of, in the boxing world. Yeah. He was like young, good looking guy, winning every fight. Yeah. But it was so corrupt, like it always has been, and mm. always connected to the underworld. Mm. And what was it like for you then, as a kid growing up? You said you went to a private school. Is that because I went, old... no, I went to a private school when I was young? And yeah. then obviously, when we moved over to Kent, I went to a little, just a normal little primary school, mm. then a normal comprehensive, which was everyone knew who my dad was, but I didn't. I sort of I didn't see that. Yeah. I just thought because I, I used to say to my dad, "What do you do for a living?" And he said, "Dad, I'm a, I'm a son. I'm a problem solver." Yeah. I said, "What do you mean?" He went, "Well, someone comes to me with a problem, and I solve it." Yeah. And I knew he had nightclubs and he had like late night drinkers. Proper entrepreneur, yeah, problem but solver. He, but he used to, I used to remember the careers officer saying to me, she went, what do you want to do when you leave school? I went, I want to be like my dad. 
She went, what does your dad do? I said, well, he gets up about 11 o'clock in the morning, puts his suit on, goes and plays snooker <laughs> with his mates, goes out for lunch, has a few drinks, comes home, and he goes to his club in the evening. Yeah. He's like the Sopranos, yeah. like the English Sopranos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, and then she's like, real life isn't like that. I said, well, it fuck it is. I watch him do it every yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. So that was. So when you were growing up then, you see your old man earning a pound note, you see him hanging around with all the, all the chaps and stuff. Were you at a point where you, did you know you, you were naughty inside? Was there something inside? Were oh, you I, was born? Born, I was born naughty and yeah. I died naughty, but mm. it's, it's, it's finding that equal, it's finding that equal level really. Now I, I don't, I don't like that. I could never go back to that life now. Yeah, it's. I think it's a young man's game, mm. and it's although I've still got that naughty spirit and the energy, but I like things different now. How old are you, Jimmy? Fifty one. Fifty one. Okay. Mm. So no, I've, and I've led it. For, I've, I've done it since the age of bloody 16, 17. I've been bang at it, and it's not for me. What age did you start earning a pound note? I was always I was earning a pound note at twelve years old. Okay, doing. I, I was, I was selling bits and pieces at school. I'd always, I'd always find a way to sort of get something and, and earn it. Mm. I just, I, I was like a little entrepreneur. I loved yeah. it. I loved earning a pound note. Yeah. And what were you, what were you flogging at school? Everything. I mean, I remember once I was up the spill when a geezer gave me a, a resin bar. You know, like the old soap what, bars. What an old nine bar. No, 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 like the old, like the old resin soap yeah. bar. And I used to put it in the microwave, Jim. He said, smash it soften there for it two or three minutes, soften <laughs> it up, and cut it up into little chunks and do it, Flog do it, it. ten or fifteen quid at school. And all the older kids were coming to me left, right, yeah. and I thought, fuck, you know, this is good money. This is. I was earning a proper pound note. And, and all, all my mates were going out on a Saturday earning like five all day washing cars. Yeah. I was uh, bringing home a bottle like 200 yeah. quid on a Saturday afternoon yeah. for just sitting in the spill for a few hours. Yeah. All, the, all, the, all the old gangsters, Roddy Easterbrook, uh, all the old Frenchies at Smith's, going, there's a score, Jim, there's a score. Yeah. And I was just, just doing cups of tea and I thought, fuck, you know, I love this. And I was around all that, all the naughty boys, mm. which I loved. Yeah. It was like, I was like a sponge soaking up all the atmosphere. Yeah. It was brilliant. So everything you were clocking on what they were doing, did, were you taking that into, <coughs> your, late, into your later life? Uh, Roddy Easterbrook, he was a renowned armed robber who used to come up the spill. He'd been done for loads of shootings. He was a lovely guy. You wouldn't think he was like that. Old skinny silver hair chap. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, but just played kaluki. Yeah. And I said to my dad, how did he get his money? He went, oh, he works the pavement, son. I went, what do you mean the pavement? He went, well, he's a blagger. He goes out, he goes, he nicks a few quid. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, you know, when they're delivering wages, they go and sneak the wages, son. Or they're a jump up merchant. I went, What's a jump up merchant? Daddy? He went, well, they'll get their ovals. They drive around a big van. He said, as they're delivering stuff to shops and that, he said, they drive on and nick a few boxes. But to me, that was normal. Yeah. That was just, and then it was just like, everybody's going to nick their few quid. Mm. But it just seemed normal. And it didn't seem like you was doing anything wrong. Mm. And, when, and after your school life, where did you? Did, where did that leave you to? You obviously at school, I, you're earning a pound note from the yeah, early age of 12 I mean, onwards. I, I got, obviously, I was growing up with the Speelers and my dad had like drinking clubs. I got into the film game. Mm. So I remember my dad got me a job on the Batman movie in 1988 <laughs> with Jack Nicholson. He, my dad was doing the security on the film. Was he? It's funny enough, Dave Courtney and all that was on the film. Yeah, Tony Denham, who's now a big star in Football Factory, Gangster Number One. Yeah. And we was all on that together as film extras. But my dad's mate was a stunt coordinator. And how old were you at the time? I was 17. Okay. So my dad's mate was a stunt coordinator, Eddie Stacey. So every time he was giving me special actions. So every time you done like a little stunt or jumped over the car, you got a pony, which was 25 yeah. quid. So I'm 17, I'm getting 200 quid for the night's work, six till six in the morning. Every time I fuck up a take, they might do 20 takes at 25 quid a time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, fucking hell, my mates have just got jobs. Here. And I was earning, I went and bought myself a brand new BMW yeah. for working six weeks. Yeah. And I thought, no, nah, this is what it's what. But then this is before the years of sat nav. They would, I phone up the, the, the equity and, and the FAA, the guy they got any work and they go, yeah, yeah, turn up at such and such place. Oh, I couldn't read a fucking A to Z for love yeah. money. So I would, if it was local, South London, Black Heath or anywhere, mm. I could get to or Ely, I'd, I'd get there. But if it was too long, I'd just, I never used to turn up, then you'd get yourself blacklisted. Mm. And I thought, fuck, I started hanging around with all my dad's friends' sons. And then obviously that's when the sort of a graft come in. Mm. And when did it really pick up for you then? <coughs> when you started properly grafting? Uh, I was 19 and I was uh, drinking in a place called Charlie's in South London. Yeah. Started mixing with some big, big fa faces. And they was, I didn't realise at the time, but they was all using Brinks Mac money. Yeah. Which my dad had been accused of the Brinks Mac robbery. So they was all using Brinks Mac money to sort of turn around and put back and, and bits and pieces. But a lot of it went wrong and there was a lot of murders mm. in South London over it. Mm. But no, I was working, hanging about with them. We was going up to Limelight, knocking out Limelight, 10, 20, yeah. 15 grand a night. We was in a VIP yeah. bar, living the dream. Yeah. I remember Elton John on the piano and uh, I was with a geezer called Eugene Carter, a big gangster. And he slung about 10 grand out the window in a carry bag. Someone what just played him, it was all in Scottish fivers and tennis. He threw 10 grand out the window. <laughs> you saw the black cabs outside Shasby Avenue and everyone running out of fears, <laughs> grabbing the money. It was like, it was like sung out of fucking yeah. a film. It was like, and I thought, fucking, I love this. Mm. But obviously driving all nice cars, or a little Merc Cosworth, a Range Rover, and I'm sitting there 19 years old. And I thought, God, this is it. 
but with they, with that life, you learn there's no honour amongst thieves. No, there's not. They, they would turn you over. They would listen. They, I saw them slipping off of each other's girlfriends and wives if they could. Mm. There was no honour. Mm. And if these people could do that to their own wives and, girl, and friends' girlfriends, mm. what could they do to their friends? Mm. So you see, I saw that at an early age. Feel bad in with the cocaine. What age at, did you start taking cocaine? About twenty. I ruined my boxing career for it. Yep. I was quite. I was, I was a real up and coming fighter. Ruined my totally ruined my boxing career, and I, I lost. I, and I lost out on some good years with my mum and dad. What year? What year were you twenty? Roughly. What so year I'm fifty one now. So you, what's so 71, 81, 90s, 91, 91, yeah, 91. 90, yeah. And so you 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 found cocaine, and did it get you straight away? It didn't get me straight away because I, I remember getting half a gram on a Thursday and enjoying it. And then when the money become more accessible yeah. and you had loads of money, free for one, yeah. you'd be sitting in fucking, you'd be sitting for two days going partying or yeah. it was just a continuous spiral. Mm. This was the days before you get Nick's having a drug test in a car. Yeah. And we found E's, the doves, the white yeah. doves. And it was just like carnage. Yeah. We was like eating Ministry of Sound, yeah. every club in like, And we had like Carl's Blanche to do what we wanted. Yeah. So we would go into Legends, all these clubs at the time, Browns. And it was brilliant. Doing the rounds. For Denzies, we'd yeah. done all the best clubs. Yeah. But living the dream. Mm. But then it wasn't a dream because it sort of, it took over my life drugs. Did When you when you found out that you sort of hit it in the sort of early 90s, you found cocaine. And obviously, I would imagine, are you an addictive personality? Yeah, very big, so, yeah, very, very okay. much so. Yeah. And did you find that, obviously you probably didn't learn about addiction back then. It's only now you look back and go what addiction was. Did well, you know what addiction was back then? No, didn't. No. Just it, it would be back then you're just a cokehead. Yeah. Or someone, it was someone who liked to, or greedy cunt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was it. Sorry, you used the C word. But yeah. no, it was, a, it was greedy bastard. Yeah. And it's not that I see people, I, I mean, those, those gang, my dad always said to me that some gangsters are no good. Yeah. He said they would just use you until it suits them and you'd be offloaded. Mm. He said they just take what they want and then when it's gone, it's your. He said, they will use you because of who I am. Yeah. But he said, a lot of them, it, it, as I said, it opened a lot of doors, mm. having a dad like I did, mm. but it also closed a lot of doors. Mm. And when my dad turned his back on me, I remember when I got bad on the coke, he said, son, I can't be around you like this. Yeah. He said, you're out of control. I've done a few bad, violent moves. And he just said, son, I can't be around that. I can't condone that. How old were you when your old man said that? I was about 22. Wow, and it, so and a couple, it, only a couple of years in. Yeah, a couple of years in. He just said, son, I can't, I can't watch my son like this. He said, he said he, I mean, he had a go at me a good few times, but he just, I was one of those people who I'd do what I wanted to do. Yeah. It was, and it, looking back now, I wasted a lot of the 90s. I'd say the 90s were a blur to me. I loved the 90s. Did you? No, <gasps> I, I said, no, don't get me wrong. I had some great parties. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> did you, did you find, did you find, did you have discipline? I, my mum gave me a lot of discipline. My mum wore the trousers. She would, my sister ended up being a stockbroker in, in Wall Street. Yeah. So she, my mum was very, very strict. Yeah. She is a kid. If I'd done something wrong, I was, I was, but, I was stuck, stuck indoors. But we're saying that as a kid, if you found cocaine at 20 and your old man after a couple of years had pulled you aside and went, Jimmy, mate, you can't keep acting like that. And you're like, I don't care. I'm carrying on because the cocaine took over. Yeah. It seemed to me that you probably didn't have much discipline. I did with my mum. With my, your mum. My, my mum. My dad, but, my dad was too, my dad was like, he was like, I'll give you one example. I was at school and I come home and I got and I got a real bad grade in maths. And my mum was like a mathematician. She was yeah. like, she was an accountant, bookkeeper. She was like, she like, she cooked the books. Yeah. And she cooked uh, the books. I can say that now because she's dead. She's dead. But yeah. no, but uh, no, she Good. cooked the books for everyone. Okay. And uh, I remember me, I come home and meet that and my mum went, what's what's what, 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 you're not even bothered about his school. He went, oh, he's, he's only fucking school. He didn't. She went, no, what, what is wrong with you? So she got me a, a maths tutor and all that. And then one day I'd come home and I'd set fire to the school. We'd set squash courts like just by accident yeah. and it burnt half of it down. And she, he, he's on the phone. She's making me, ah, Jimmy's a boy. He's fucking only burnt half the school down. I yeah. went, look at you, you're proud of him doing that. Yeah. What, what's wrong with you? I think my dad was very, he was a soft touch. Yeah. He would he would, he would let, I think because he'd led such an eventful life, yeah. he sort of just let me do what I wanted. Mm. And it was uh, the wrong thing, really. So when you look back at that, when someone lets you do what you want and then you mix in alcohol and cocaine into the mix as a young 20-year-old, knowing, did you know that you were fully protected? You could do whatever you want and feel that the fallback would be you use your old man's surname? I did know, really. And, yeah. and that was I think that was the downside, yeah. Dodge. It was... Uh, and I, yeah, it was, yeah. No, yeah. you're right, yeah. It was because it's, it was like a license to steal. Yeah. It was like, you see the good fellas and they go, look, we could do anything we wanted. We wanted it, we just yeah. took it. If they complained, we'd whack them so yeah. hard they wouldn't try again. Yeah. But yeah, and it was, I was working with a little crew who were, who were very naughty and a lot of money. And to add that into the mix, I had my dad. Yeah. And if he, my dad said that, I mean, a lot of times my dad was called to sit downs. 
And obviously we had a few sit downs with people and then my dad said, nah, listen, and my, you couldn't go higher than my dad. Yeah. So it was what he said goes. Did your old man ever go pull you aside and go, Jim, you can't carry on like this, mate, because you're doing my surname not a good, you're not good at doing lot, it justice. A lot of times, but do you know what it was? It would, it, it, I think we had such a bond. We were, we were more like mates. Yeah. We would go out, we would go out and have a drink together and that. And it was just such a fascinating character. I think it was sort of, I don't know, he let a lot slip with me. Yeah. I think because I was his sort of like blue-eyed boy, yeah. he would let anything go. I mean, even when my mum my mom sort of fell out, he'd still meet me and my dad and still bang me a few quid or he'd still look, he'd always look after me. Mm. And why did you fall out your mum? My mum just didn't hate, she hated that life. She didn't really like those people. Yeah. She, although was my, she a straight doer? My mum's a straight goer, yeah, okay. but obviously she knew what my dad done. Yeah. But my dad was very good at it. Yeah. He never spent one day in jail. Yeah. He mixed in very high circles. Yeah. And he earned a lot of money. But she was, she was, she hated to see me on, I think it was the cocaine. Yeah. No parent wants to see the, the no. child on drugs. My mum just went, no, don't want you around the house. Don't want you, don't want you, nowhere near us. And my dad sort of still meet me and still, it, or even though I know it was awkward for him. Were you still living at home then? No, no, no. She, my mum chucked me out. I was sort of living, I was living with all with different friends. Okay. I had a flat in a, over in the Isle of Dogs, yeah. near Popular. Yeah. And that was, I was, I was living the life. I, and to be honest, I, I was sort of enjoying it. Mm. I was going out partying all the time. Yeah. We was, and it was obviously still down to my dad. I could get into all the string fellas, yeah. all the top clubs in London. And Lenny McLean worked Hippodrome. Yeah. So he would always look after us. When you look back now and think what you put your mum through, how would you feel? I f do you know what it was? Because when my mum died, died, she died last August, August the 10th. Yeah. And I nursed her for a year while she was dying of cancer. She had terminal cancer. Yeah. And we spoke a lot about it because we spent a lot of time together. And she sort of, we become really, really good friends in the end. And it was, she said, look, you're the love of my life. Yeah. You're, my, you're my firstborn, you're my son. I really, really love you. She said, but I can honestly say, for the first, you're 49 now. Yeah. And I'm the first time in my life, I'm proud of you. She said, wow. I just see what you've done for me and come back and, and I've seen how you've changed. I mean, my sister, she didn't come and see my mum twice in a year. I mean, mum, obviously when she was dying, she went, I'm gonna change my will. She went, I wanna leave you 75% of everything. Is that right? She went, because I've seen a change in you and I really, I feel that I wanna give you something to start mm. up in life. So when your, your mum clocked it at maybe the age of 22 and that this cocaine was blowing out of proportion. Yeah. You said that at 49, you nursed your mum. How many years did you, not speak with your mum? Oh no, it was it was sporadic. It was like um, the odd sort of, maybe when I was 22 to when I was 23, then I, then I was good for a year. And I was then I started boxing, uh, doing unlicensed boxing. Yeah. Then she was okay. But then she, my mum wouldn't tolerate a fall and she'd call yeah. a spade a spade. Yeah. So anytime I was playing up, no, she, she didn't. Knew. She knew. She would be cold, <laughs> she would be cold and cut. Okay. So she was like, she well, was- Well, she would just cut you out. Is that her way of, <coughs> is that her way of- She called uh, it tough love. Okay. I remember knocking at the door and she went, nah. She yeah. went, no, nah, come back when you're totally clean. Yeah. She went, and it's called tough love. Yeah. And I, and do you know what I'm saying? I respect that. But do you know when we say like totally clean now, like we're in year 2022, everyone knows about CA, NA, AA, all the, all the addiction. Yeah. Back then, people weren't even talking about To be NA, honest, no, that's AA, right. that sort of stuff. They it wasn't, it wasn't out there. To be honest. I, well, it was out there, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't openly public for people. No, and do you know what it is? It's seeing there was people, no internet back then. No, I think the internet's ruined a lot of things. Mm. I think it's made people, I think it's made the cow brave. You get all these little keyboard warriors, yeah, didn't you? Yeah. But no, I think life's gone, for me, I would actually like to do something and help people in who was in my position. Because yeah. I do think drugs is bad. Mm. Don't get me wrong, I had some great nights out, but that it's, if, as you said, if you've got an addictive personality, yeah. it can it can ruin you. And life. you don't know you've got an addictive personality. And you don't That's know, because, because we're not, we're not, uh, you're not, yeah, no one's there to tell you yeah. uh, this, that, or the other, or you ADHD, or you you got this, yeah. unless you get diagnosed properly. Yeah. But back then it wasn't like that. So sometimes it could be and it, mental health. What did cocaine make you feel like when you took it? Back then, it made me feel fantastic. I just wanted to just be out with my friends, drinking, party. I didn't want the party to stop. Yeah. And we was, there was loads of like, I mean, Gary Mason, the old boxer. Oh, British Gary. Gary was, Bless him. Gary was one good friend of mine and he, yeah. he sort of lived over uh, the Isle of Dogs and I used to go over and see Gary. We'd go out on a Thursday to Stringfellas, black and white it was yeah. called. Then we'd be out till the Sunday. Yeah. And it, we had some great, great Didn't nights. Didn't Gary get run over? Joe's was really was sad. It, sad. it was 2010, it? I believe. That's right. I think it was around that time, because a lot of people were on his bicycle, wasn't he? Yeah, he was driving to work in a hospital yeah. on his push bike, and he got hit by a van. I remember. And Gary always had a big head anyway, yeah. didn't he? But he must have hit and had a fall. I mean, he was. I think he was 49 at the time, Gary. Yeah, 49. Jesus. 
And I've seen a lot of people. Lovely fellow he is. Gary was the yeah. biggest gentleman. And do you know he had Proper the best gen. British heavyweight record yeah. of any boxer? Yeah. 37 fights, 36 wins, one defeat to Lennox Lewis. Lennox, yeah. Yeah. And I remember Gary always coming out Gary and he was like massive and he was like, he was like, but he was so funny. Mm. He had the best personality. Mm. So when you were going on in your 20s now, what, <coughs> what were you doing for a pound note? You obviously weren't going straight. I was involved very much in the drug game. Okay. Obviously, I was working with a big, big syndicate. Yeah. Obviously, uh, and we lived a very lavish lifestyle. And obviously then we started doing robberies and then I was working with all different people. This wine bar was called Charlie's. Yeah. And you had armed robbers there drug dealers there, drug barons there, yeah. the hierarchy of the South, East London, underworld. Mm. So you could never not, there's always work available. Mm. And then there was one guy called Pat Thomas there who used to drink with us. This was 1991 and he he had robbed a city broker of 292 million pounds worth of bearer bonds. 200? 292 million pounds worth of cashable bearer bonds. How did he, how did he do it that? Was, it, they reckon it was all set up. It's a big, big, there's a big thing on the, uh, all the YouTube channels about yeah. it. It's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write a book about this because it's a really interesting story. Yeah. I was Tell a, me. So we, this was 1991, I was working with some uh, armed robbers out of Greenwich, doing little bits and pieces for them. Yeah. And Pat- You say you say bits and pieces, what were you doing for them? Well, they was doing robberies, I'd move the car, bits and pieces, and, and, and I was with them all the time. So, so you weren't going in there shooting up, nicking the money, no, you were just no, working no, with no, them? No, 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 okay. and I think they was probably too scared to take me like that because of me dad. Yeah. So, and I got nicked for an armed robbery because I was with Gary one day, a friend of mine who got arrested for the armed robbery. Yeah. And we, they, 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 the flying squad landed on us and I had a load of money in my possession yeah. and a Patek Philippe watch on, which I just sold him, but they had tried to middle me up in the robbery yeah. because some of the notes I had on me had come from the robbery. Yeah. So this is like, okay. you had the good cop, bad yeah. cop. And uh, I was on bail and Gary ended up getting 15 years. He got me out of it because I was nothing to do with the robbery. But I was just literally this day meeting him at an Afro-Caribbean barber's and the flying squad landed on us. Mm. And it was just, just in the wrong place at the wrong, at the wrong mm. time. But uh, yeah, Pat was one of our sort of crew and he was a mixed race guy. And uh, he'd done this robbery with the bearer bonds. And today, it was equivalent of today, about 800 million pounds. What is a bearer bond? A bearer bond used to be like a cashable bond. It was very, very similar to like, uh, it's like having a Bitcoin uh, certificate. Yeah, okay. So that's that's the best way to, okay. so the viewers would understand. Yeah. But this was the biggest robbery, the world's biggest ever robbery. And uh, there was a there was a couple uh, who was involved. They had, they were found in uh, over, where was it? Uh, in Essex. Epping Forest. Yeah. It was found over that way with both the folks cut and shot in the head. No. Yeah. Uh, Pat got shot. We'd been out one day to Greenwich. We went up in the Ministry of Sound. Pat got searched by some doorman at the Ministry of Sound mm. and he had a gun on him. So yeah. he sort of went, no, 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 I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. He flipped off. Then later the next morning, got a phone call. He was found shot dead on his doorstep in Broccoli. So uh, it was a, uh, they, they said they ruled it out of suicide. But Pat wouldn't have done that. No. They had, and then when they, the, the, the police tried to mug him off for some sort of like, um, like it snatched the, the wages, yeah. the way the, the sorry the uh, the bonds, and he uh, they found that he had like hundreds of thousands of pounds stashed away in all different building site accounts all over London, and obviously they they said it was uh, to do with the IRA, the mafia, the the Irish mob, the Colombian cartel. This was a big big thing, but there was lots of murders over it, and I got arrested with a few other people uh, by MI5. I was at my mum and dad's house. I remember a seven series BMW pulling up. And we was uh, took to Knightsbridge Crown Knightsbridge Crown Court, which was funny enough in London Bridge. Yeah. So we went there, and it was all like a blackout on the case. We I was remanded on bail uh, with loads of different uh, bits and pieces, uh, not to do this, not to do that. And uh, it went on for about fifteen months, and then it, all charges were dropped out at, 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 after fifteen months at Knightsbridge Crown Court. There was nothing against me, but because I'd been obviously hanging around with these firm, yeah. It was yeah, I was arrested in connection. Mm. And what year was that? That was in ninety one. 91. Yeah, 1991. So you imagine being a young kid, yeah, right. being it for a £292 million pound robbery, hanging around with the biggest, biggest lunatics in South East London. Yeah. We would walk into Limelight and they would literally, they, we'd throw the car keys, they'd drive, we'd go straight in the VIP bit, bottles of LPR all night, dancing with Nigel Ben as, as the DJ's playing in the, in the, it's like an old church, isn't it? Yeah. And sitting there peeled up and fucking yeah. having the best nights ever. And it was like, <laughs> then we'd go into a party with someone's mansion with a swimming pool, yeah. surrounded by page three girls. And I was thinking, fucking hell, this is life. I love it. Yeah. And you don't want like, it to end. The no, party to no, end. No, no, no. And I don't think it ever did carry on for another 30 years. But uh, just with a few intervals in jail. Yeah. But no, it was no, it was a, it was an eventful life. I wouldn't change it because I think it makes you the character you are today. Yeah. But it was just, when I look back, I think, fucking hell, we had, we had, we had swirls a bit. Yeah. Because I think, fucking hell, what, everything I've been through. Do you think, did you at any point take advantage knowing that <coughs> you've got an old man who's always going to look after you? Always. Yeah. yeah because, oh. I'm not going to bullshit. Yeah. I'm not going to dress it up. Yeah. Of course I did. Yeah. I knew my dad was powerful. I knew he was, I knew that if he said something or if, if, if he 
everyone listen. Or if someone hurt you or touched you, it would listen, go back. My dad's okay. best friends were like Eddie Charlie Richardson, uh, Ronnie Olive. They, these people run London. Yeah. These these people, these they were the gang bosses. Yeah. And obviously, Charlie craves to come up the family home with Diana Dawes on a Sunday for a bit of roast dinner. And come by Diana Dawes then, she was like the Britain's uh, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. And she'd come up and do cabaret at my mum and dad's club in Bromley. And it was like growing up around that, it was just like normal. It was the norm, innit? Ray yeah. Winston would come round, you know, I think he was asleep on the sofa one morning. I woke up, he'd been out drinking with my dad all night. Yeah. And then my dad had like friends who were like gangsters in Liverpool, yeah. Manchester, all over the country. Mm. And so every time we went we went away or we went to Marbella or we'd run into these people, go on someone's yacht. Yeah. It was just like, as a young kid, my friends were like fascinated yeah. by it. My mum and dad used to come to uh, open evening at school and they'd go, your mum and dad are like film stars. Yeah. Well, their, their mums and dads were walking in like they're getting out of their fucking full desk or mum yeah. and dad were getting out like, and then they was going on to Langham's and all that in yeah. Mayfair. Yeah, but yeah. no, it was growing up, It was I was mesmerised by my parents. Mm. And was your old man a hero for you? Oh, he's always been my hero, my yeah. only hero. Yeah. Yeah. Same. He's like, yeah, he was mm. legendary status. and But it was that, my dad had a lot of uh, good ethics around him. He would, he would tell me a lot of good antidotes. To, which I haven't took in till he died and passed away. Did he have good morals? Your Very man? good morals. My dad would always walk in the pub, bypass all the gangsters. They'd all stand up, yeah. shake his hand, yeah. and he'd sit and drink with a window cleaner. Yeah. And I said, Dad, why do you always sit with a window cleaner for? Like, 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 all the gangsters do it. Son, don't be phased by them people. They're, yeah. they're mugs. Mm. He said, son, they're out drinking now. Their wives can't afford to put the electric on. Yeah. He said, because they want to sit and give it provide big, big time mm. bollocks in the pub. Mm. He said, tomorrow, son, he said, he, is, he said, listen, these people go to work nine to five. He said, they go home and feed their families. Yeah. They put their wives first and children. He said, they're real men. And I always go, ah, sitting there with a fucking mug. He went, son, I choose who I want. He yeah. said, I can drink with whoever I want. And they're the real people. Mm. And I liked it. When I look at it now, and he's right what he says. And he said, and he, I remember he used to see guys on the on the stairs. And they, one guy was playing a... Um, the sax one day, my dad said, he was a really good sax player one day. So, he said, so my dad bung him a score, yeah. it was 20 quid. Yeah. And he went out to get yourself a meal and all that and, a, and, a, and, a, and have a drink tonight mm. on me. And I went, Dad, why are you giving that old tramp? He went, son, don't ever judge anyone on, on their uppers. He said, that man was a very good jazz musician with my friend, Ronnie Scott. Because yeah. my dad used to obviously, he was a famous boxer and Ronnie Scott was his biggest fan. Yeah. So Ronnie Scott's jazz club, yeah, we, had a big, we grew up going to see Peter King there, getting the best table. Ronnie Scott's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. my dad's best, one of my dad's yeah. closest friends. He used to follow my dad everywhere. Mm. Like Richard Attenborough, he used to follow my dad boxing, Joan Collins. Because yeah. I, I didn't know these stories until, because obviously I wasn't interested. So when, so your old man was obviously a face in the boxing, <coughs> boxing world. Did he ever did he ever go and earn a good pound note boxing or was it the nightclub money? No, yeah. no, he earned money uh, with the boxing, but he, he sort of, he sort of, he pulled out of it in his uh, mid, mid, mid 20s. And he sort of, he got into nightclubs, yeah. got into villainy, yeah. but he spent six deca decades in villainy yeah. and never ever went to prison. Got arrested plenty of times, yeah. but never ever, very, very wise Sounds old man. Sounds like one of the clever ones. He right? would never use the phone yeah. indoors. He would, he would speak, he'd speak to somebody, as soon as I was speaking, he'd put the phone down if someone spoke in a thing. Yeah. He wouldn't speak indoors. He yeah. was very, he wouldn't speak in a car. If he had to pick in his car, he'd go and clean all the windows after. He always had a window lead in the kitchen while in the car. <laughs> what you do that for, Danny? He went, no, no, no. He said, I've had a few people in the car. Yeah. And I used to think, what a fucking old crazy bastard. Yeah. But it, in reality, fingerprints and things like that, he was... Mate, he sounds like he was one step ahead. There's not many people these days can say they haven't been banged up. No. And for your old man, not been banged up he for 60 years. He was 84 when he died in uh, 20th of October, 2016. And I remember getting a phone call. It was about 10 past seven in the morning. My mum phoned me, she went, I just got in. I've been out partying all night. I was living in Brighton. And she went, Jim, your dad's died. I went, oh, I started crying. I was going out. But we had been expecting it because he had dementia. What year was this? 2016. 16, okay. 20th of October. Okay. 7 o'clock in the, 10 past 7 in the morning. Yeah. He died at 6.53. And it was, I remember crying. I was really upset. And I went, Mum. And she went, Jim, he's been ill for so long. It, it is. She said, I was there. I was holding his hand. And it was like, I remember going out that day. I was on Brighton. Seafront and it was, it was cold freezing. I remember having half a Guinness mm. and I, he loved a Cahiba cigar, my dad. Mm. And a few pubs again, I went, yeah, cheers, dad. I remember going out and having a like, mad day and a night. And I was off the rails in Brighton. Yeah. Brighton was a crazy place for yeah. me. It's like full of it's everything. Like, it's, it's where everyone goes who don't want to grow up. Yeah, it's like, yeah, absolutely. It's like you, everyone just wants to carry on taking yeah. drugs and be like, it's like yeah. you see all the old EPs down, they're still yeah. carried on partying like they're yeah. 16. But no, it's, uh, I moved away from Brighton. Uh, I got banged up in 2018. Spent a year away, and that really sort of sorted me out. Mm. I want to go back to your 20s. Gone. I want to your 20s there. We're talking 21, 22, 23, cocaine. Has cocaine stayed with you up until your late 40s? <coughs> yeah, I would say not Not so bad in my 30s and 40s, mm. but sort of it was, it's, it's, look, people go in there, it's like if you have a vodka and a tonic with some ice, yeah. 
it's like cocaine's normal. Every, mm. every pub, Everyone's in every yeah. country, you go, you're going, I mean, I, I'm- A I'm, lawyer, a dentist, everyone's listen, yeah. accessible. I mean, I mean yeah. everyone, I, I mean, I know lawyers, in a, yeah. immigration, immigration lawyers, yeah. they're all, everyone's bang yeah. on it. Yeah. Everyone, it's just acceptable now. Mm. But it's, it's I, don't, I mean, I, 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 don't do it so, I don't do it so much now. Don't get me wrong, if I was out and I wouldn't buy it, yeah. I, well, I was, if I was out and I was drunk, someone might give me a little pinch or something, I might do Have that. Have a corner. Cool but yeah. I'm not really, I choose now, my nights now, if I go out, it's to a lovely restaurant, a few bottles of Barolo, I might have a bottle of champagne, no, and then we go over early and I'm sitting watching Netflix. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's yeah, a, that's yeah, a yeah, night yeah. for me now, loads of chocolate. And a what, were you doing, what were you doing in your 20s to earn a pound note? What did you get banged up? What did you get caught for? Uh, we, we, we got done, we really, in, in my 20s, it was uh, theft and uh, robberies. Okay. But it's something I'm not proud of, and I'm really not, but it was, as I said, the people I was hanging around with, it was like, we was all at it. It was like, if you go to a pub full of builders and you're you're doing a bit of flooring or doing a bit of roofing, yeah. scaffolding, they're all the people in the pub. Everyone in this pub was a villain, a gangster and a crook. Mm. So they was all bang at it. You might have someone doing drugs, someone was at the fourth game. Mm. So if we was on a bit of work and we had a load of uh, paperwork or what we needed to do, we'd give it to the fourth yeah. stand and then he would go and do that. Mm. And then there was like people, you'd have car thieves getting the cars and bringing the cars to us for bits of work. So it was a, it was just a, a den of uh, naughty boys. Naughty people. Yeah. What, you, what were you thieving? Anything, everything, anything give for me money. Example. Give me an example. Give you an example. Back then, it was people would do, we were doing uh, cash boxes. Yeah. So if some, you know, it was loading up from a van to a shop and yeah. taking the money, in, we'd nick the boxes. But you'd have to judge the. Will boxes. Will you be carrying? Will you be carrying a shooter with you or not? Do you know, Sonny? I've I've been arrested for a few, few home robberies, but obviously this was what we was what we was up to. We was taking a few cash boxes. Some people might have been armed. I wasn't particular. Yeah. I wasn't armed. I didn't. Did you have the fear of carrying? I, I, do you know what it was? Part of me, even if I was going through that drug drug yeah. thing, I always knew right from wrong. Yeah. And sometimes it was the lifestyle what, what would push me over to do those things, mm. Dodge. Mm. I didn't really want to do those things. I did know the right right between right and wrong. Mm. But it sort of it was the money. It was it was it was chasing the money. And the money was paying for your cocaine habit. It was paying for my lifestyle. For everything, the whole I always lifestyle. wanted to wear a nice watch, so yeah. I wanted a nice gold like midi Rolex at the time. Yeah. Everyone was it was the in watch to wear. I'd want a nice Mercedes Cosworth, yeah. which was the car to have. So it's all so nice basically clothes. you want all the nice stuff for the <coughs> outside for the show. It was for the show, yeah. yeah. It's but also it's to fund the lifestyle. Obviously, yeah. you get drinking LPR costs money, doesn't it? Yeah. Drink taking drugs costs money. Mm. But obviously we'd have our little rackets, we'd have like we'd have a postman who would bring us dodgy credit cards. Yeah. And then we'd have the shops which would take those credit cards. <laughs> then that would, that would sort the clothing out. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then, then we'd sell the, the, the access clothes to fund and yeah. then as soon as that ran out, we'd be on the next little yeah. thing. And someone might come in with a load of stolen jewelry one day mm. and I'd fence out a pattern garden. Mm. I had all my people I'd take stolen jewelry to. Yeah. And then my dad's friend might phone me up and say, Oh, sit Jim, we've got a watching Liverpool is worth 100 grand. And get, rid you, get rid of it down yeah. there yeah. and we'd do that. Yeah. And then they might, and because of my dad's friends and social, social circles, a friend, but my dad's might go, hey, son, we got 50 key apart. Do you, can, you do, can you do that? And then they go, you can have 400 quid on each on each key. Yeah. And 50 key, 50 keys at 400 quid a key, it comes big money. Of course. You're talking about a 21 year old kid. Yeah. And then I've got a big lump of money. Yeah. And then I was off to America, I was off to Italy, I was I was I was I was so You were probably around. living a lifestyle, weren't you? Living a lifestyle, yeah. but then when it when it when it when it when it when it fold, when it went down, it I because I've always went down. When did when did up. it come on top? Give me an occasion when it properly come on top. It probably come on top in what was I, 24, 25, I was just doing my unlicensed boxing, I'm still going out like raging lunatic. Yeah. And I was around all the wrong people. It was uh, a few people been nicked and we were sort of going out one day and there was a big bit of violence at a pub in Bromley near where I live. Mm. And a guy got stabbed and nearly killed. And I, I got nicked for being the knife man. And obviously there was some big, big family names in, involved. You got the Dariffs, yeah. uh, Zanellis and Haywards. And obviously I took the fall. I ended up in prison for 12 weeks. And I remember sitting in there and not, no one sent me any money. And I thought, hang on a minute. I was part of this. I thought we was like the Robin Hood and his merry yeah. merry men, and there was no there was no honour amongst the thieves. Mm. I I was left pretty much to lucky enough for me though the charges was all dropped, and I walked away. But I could if that guy would have died, or if or if that guy would have pressed charges, I would have been in lots of trouble. Yeah, I'd have had a big court case, maybe looking at a potential big big sentence, yeah. a life changing sentence. Yeah. But it was then I started realising these people aren't aren't friends of mine. Mm. Then then they're, they're they're out for the good time. Mm. If you walk in somewhere and you ain't got any money, you're not anyone's friend. It's yeah. it was all about what you had or what you could do. Yeah, and you see that those people aren't real. And did you find you became one of them? 
over time in that in that period i think you become ruthless cold-hearted yeah and it's all about it's all about money 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 change it's you well, I could see it. My, and my dad was right what he said. The yeah. gangsters, are, they're not nice people, son. They're yeah. not, listen, these people were like leeches. Mm. He said, when you've got nothing or you've got nothing to offer them, you're no good to anyone. Mm. He said, but listen, all the nice people, those people always look after you. Mm. They always have your back. Mm. And, he's, and he's right what he said. Mm. What, was the, what was the story about the diamonds? I got done on a diamond thing, uh, diamond robbery. They said it was a diamond robbery, big diamond heist. It was basically, we, <laughs> basically, we, it was a harebrained scheme that we, we arranged to meet this, this jeweler that we built up a relationship What year are we talking here, roughly? 2012. So, okay. So, we got, we've been talking to this jeweler online, blah, 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 built, built it up. She ended up turning up with a million pounds worth of stones, uninsured to a hotel. By herself? By herself. <laughs> You could not write this. And it's like, I changed it from the, the, the Dorchester Hotel at the last minute to a three-star Best Western in fucking probably. How she didn't suss out, I don't fucking know. But no, it was and it's, it was it was a hairbrain thing. There was a, So I turned up, I ended up slipping off with a few stones worth a quarter of a million pound. But and, how did you get, what, what, just, let's roll that back a little bit. <coughs> how did you get her to bring a million pounds worth of diamonds I'm to a, a hotel? Talker. I'm a good, good, good talker. I'm a good talker. What was the chat? Do you know, it was, uh, I was bringing an Arab friend to look at some stones who was buying these for his daughters. Uh, out in Saudi, so uh, she was greedy. You? She was, uh, but listen, that she got the she got the last laugh. Yeah, I ended up paying a pocker proceeds of crime act, which was more than we had, uh, four times more than I actually got for the diamonds. Right. So in the end, it, it came back to bite me on the ass. Which so tell me, tell me what happened that night then? You or that no, it was day, It was a daytime. Yeah. So she turned up. Uh, I can't think she had a Range Rover. She's turned up, very glamorous lady, and uh, she's turned up. We got talking. I had a friend of mine there. He was talking too much bollocks. He was coming across like the Arab, and I just remember walking out with the diamonds, just like it was nothing. But then what had happened? Her husband became a bit suspicious yeah. at the last minute, and I turned up. So as I was walking out the hotel with the diamonds, my friend was caught there. The husband turned up, he, I remember we had a Porsche come charging, but I just walked past, got into my friend's car. By the time all the police were there, I was already in the hand garden cashing the diamonds out. It was so it was like it was like the key, it was like but I, I wanna know, I wanna know that story. I wanna <coughs> roll back a little bit more. How did you get the diamonds out of her hand and how did she not see you walk off? Well she got the toilet, I, I, she I, I, go, I'm like I'm like a magician. So no, I, I was like, I was looking at opening the boxes up and putting my diamond in my in my palm of my hand and sort of closing the box back up. Just this it was like psychological tricks. Yeah. So and I was doing that. But obviously if I if I wanted to if I wanted I could have easily done it. I could have walked straight out with a million pounds worth. Yeah. It was easy. And how much did you walk out with? It was a quarter million pounds worth. Was it? Mm. Which is like 10, 15 minutes work. And then obviously it was then we cashed them out in Hatton Garden. And, uh, but then obviously when I got arrested, I was, they had me down for a big, they said it was a diamond heist. And it was, I would say it was a high value diamond theft. So I got, I got caught down in Ramsgate. I remember being in a hotel, the hotel, I come back to a hotel one night and it was quiet as anything. It was, it was dead as a doornail. I walked in, I saw these two dodgy looking geese. I thought, I just didn't look right. You know, it was, and I thought- Your sense. Yeah, yeah, I sensed it, sixth yeah. sense. Walked to the room, I remember, oh, police, bang, the door went through. One of them fired a taser, but it had like one of those neck curtains and it sizzled all the curtain. I was straight, straight, straight to fire it at me, but missed. And the hooks have caught the curtain and fizzled yeah. up all the curtain. It ended up nicking me. I ended up being sent to Belmarsh. Um, I ended up getting 27 months, high value theft. But then the judge ruled out it was a confiscation case, which meaning obviously I proceeded by, proceeded to do with the crime, yeah. so I had to pay confiscation. So, so you've taken the diamonds, you've gone down Hatton Garden City, cashed them out, cashed them out. Yeah. How many days after that do you get the, the, the doors banged out? I was banged. I was. I got nicked. Do you know what it is? I got nicked. I logged onto Facebook in a little bar in in, uh, no. in Ramsgate. And they picked yeah, it up. They picked it up, and then they come back. And there was only one big hotel there at the time. It was called the Swallow. And how many days after? How many days? That after? was three weeks later. So they're looking for you. For oh no, no, they, they was putting my door through. They was going well. Where I lived, I had gates. You couldn't get through the gate. Yeah, it was okay. Like a proper big solid gate. But my girl, my poor ex-girlfriend, she was. They was coming to her every single day. But they put a tracker on her car. The funny thing was, her friend borrowed her Mini Cooper convertible. So her friends borrowed the car and driven towards Portsmouth. But going over some bridge in Portsmouth, all the cars were <laughs> blocked in. All our police, because she had, a, she had a, she had a daughter's boyfriend in the yeah. car. They thought it was me. Yeah. So all our police dragging her out of the car. But they tracked it. They put a tracker yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was hilarious. But uh, she. She phoned me and told me. Obviously, I was changing my numbers every single day. Yeah. I would only phone her from a withheld number. But yeah, no, it was. What's that feeling like when you're on the run? You're three weeks horrible on the run. Dodge, horrible. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what it was? Yeah. It's you're living days. How old were you roughly when this was going on? Yeah, this was 12 years ago, so late 30s. 39. So late 30s, 40s, early not 40s. Good, not so. a good time. No, no. yeah, late 30s. Yeah. And it, it was, I thought, 
has it really come to this? Yeah. It, we were meant to do the bit of work properly and set it up properly. But in saying that, I'm glad we didn't. Yeah. Because I'd have got a lot longer in prison yeah. and I'd have bigger confiscation. So, and that's when I realised crime for me don't pay. Yeah. Crime does pay till the day you get caught. Yeah. But now you've got the pocket on top of that. Yeah. Proceeds of Crime Act. Yeah. So crime doesn't pay now. Mm. Crime might have paid for my dad, but it didn't pay for me. Mm. Times have changed, haven't they? Times have changed. Yeah. And I, I, the only thing I, the advice I'd give to young kids now is get into the bloody, these digital currencies, mm. learn by a lot of, uh, and take a look at people, go, get, into, get into politics. How did you feel when they, you went to court and they went, what'd they say to you? They got 27 months. I, well, we, yeah, I, I got, was your I, old man there, your mum there, any family there with you? Yeah, no, my mum, actually, me and my mum was getting on at the time. Uh, my ex girlfriend was there, my mum was there. I was nicked with my pal, Mark, and uh, he, he got uh, a third off of me, so he got the end up with 22 months. Uh, I got the 27 months, and uh, yeah, then I said, We're going to give you a pocket as well. He brought me back to court and said, We're going to give you a proceeds of Crime Act. How much was that? Uh, 130,000. Okay. Which is all paid off now. Yeah. Uh, so it was, and that was, and that was, I paid 30 grand to stop going because they wanted to put me back in jail. They said, if you don't pay 30 grand, you're going to get 15 months extra. Yeah. So my mum, when I come days. out, my, no, my mum said, I'll pay it for you. So she, my mum oh, paid, the 30, mom my paid the 30 you. grand, bailed me out for 30 wow. grand to stop me going back to prison for 15 months. But then I got nicked in 2019, yeah. 17th of December. I was walking in York, been out with, with some lap dancers back in the hotel room and uh, partying as we do. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I've heard Jimmy. This is, this is only like a few years ago. And I've gone, look at that window, there's fucking blue lights everywhere. I hear a helicopter yeah. up, dogs barking. I've done nothing wrong. Yeah. What's, I've got a bit of bugle on me. I put that down my top, yeah. down my top, top, top trousers, but, but, like my pants, top of my pants. Walked out, they went, put your hands on your head, do pigeon steps. And I'm like, fucking hell, there's like 20, 30 old Bill, all armed, yeah. all armed with machine guns, all the MP5s. And I was sitting there thinking, I, I was literally shut. I was literally, when you when you're two to walk pigeon steps, like one foot, he's going, put your heel to the top. Of your foot. I'm like, fuck, you've been on it since fucking seven o'clock that night. It's four in the morning. I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> this is, I, and he's then, he's whacked me with a gun. I'm on the floor. He went, I'm arresting you for the armed robbery on Liberty's nightclub on the 27th of November. I went, what? What? He's going, what? You said yes. I went, no, fuck, he didn't say yeah. yes. This is fucking bullshit. So I've gone back to York. I remember the, Fucking uh, sc uh, screwed the, the, op the old bill was opening the door. He went, Caught you smell nice. What aftershave you got on? I went, Fucking what aftershave? I thought, I'm, I'm Nick Fred, I'm Robbie, I'm on license. Yeah. So I know probation are going to recall me straight away. Yeah. So I'm back in jail. Funny enough, it turned out I was set up from a little firm in Brighton who I've been doing some bits and pieces with. Absolute tow rag called Buster. He, they, what they'd done is made it, I'd robbed the nightclub of £60,000 in cash, walked in with a gun and a big black guy when I hadn't been anywhere near it. Yeah. But I, I, when I'd when I done the interview, I said to the cop, but no, listen, mate, I can prove. I know that day I was in Leeds, yeah. I, which I was with my friend, Paul Anderson. Mm. My pal got me out. My pal done a statement and said, listen, Jimmy was with me all that day. He was lucky. He went round to all the people we'd been in the bars and the restaurants, got the CCTV yeah, because okay. they normally they, they normally erase it. Yeah. He got all the CCTV. So my friend, Paul Anderson, a businessman in York, in, sorry, in Yorkshire, in Leeds, a very big, 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 well-known guy. He got all the CCTV for me. And obviously the police dropped all the charges, mm. but then I was held to to till parole got involved. So they done it as a, as a, as a to fuck me up and mm. try and get something done to me in Lewis Jail. Mm. But I was too clever. I was mm. I, I stayed down the block, and then went straight out to Rochester Prison. Mm. I'm not silly. I knew that they was going to try and do something to me if I stayed in Lewis Jail. Mm. They tried to get me manoeuvred there. So probation. Obviously, I got out on April the third, two thousand and twenty. Mm. How long? How long? After how long? <coughs> just over four months. Four months, okay. But it's not that. Then obviously I found out, I obviously I come out and it was COVID had hit. Yeah. So as I come out of prison, I said, can I get a taxi? He went, I won't get a taxi now. I'm walking along, it was like, it was like a zombie film. It was like, there was no one about. Yeah. I was walking down the street, went to the train station. You have to wait two hours for a train. Mm. Couldn't get, there was no cars going about. Mm. I thought, it was like, it was like, it was like. The world had changed. A world had yeah. changed. Yeah. Gone back home for a living, I had to stay with my mum. That was part of my license conditions for a few months. And I remember thinking, fuck this. I said, but I've got to go and see my friends. I want to go have a party. My pal had, had serviced apartments all over Yorkshire. So we used to have, he had a penthouse in Bradford. What's the link, what's the link to Yorkshire? Is it London? I've got a lot of pals. My daughter lives in the hole. Oh, in yeah, okay. so obviously I've got a lot of friends in oh, Yorkshire. Right. So obviously living up yeah, there, yeah, I made yeah. a lot of friends. Yeah. So my friends got uh, all serviced apartments. So we went up to uh, Bradford. I used to get key worker status from my mate who was a funeral director to make out I was looking for um, places to store, like morgues to store the bodies and yeah. that. So we would go out partying, invite loads of people and have a mad party. So if the police come around, we used to see the police turn up, He they would phone him and then he would get everyone to go into different apartments. Yeah. So it was, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then obviously on the 20th of May, I got a phone call. Uh, my of ex what, 2020? 2020, yeah. my ex-girlfriend got murdered. 
So her name was Melissa Belshaw. She was she phoned me on the Wednesday, which would have been uh, no, she got murdered on the Wednesday, the twentieth. So she phoned me on the the Friday before, said, oh, "I've seen your parties on Facebook, blah blah blah. Can I can, can I come? And, can you get me somewhere to stay, Jim? I'm having murders yeah. with my ex." Yeah, I went, "Of course you can." So she was due to come and see me on the Friday. On the Wednesday, my friend phoned me, Jody Latham, who played Lipping Shameless, mm. and he went, "Jim, if you Melissa's been." Stabbed to death. I went, what do you no. mean? He went, he went, it's all over the news. He said, look at, so remember on the Friday in the newspaper, they ran a big story. Uh, she was, a little girl was there. He tried to kill a little girl as well. And it was an ex-boyfriend cage fighter. He'd come in, found the book, my book, which was to my future wife. She'd been reading it, yeah. found text messages and then stabbed her with a knife, went straight for her heart, killed her. And he tried to stab the little girl, but one of the neighbors went smashing a golf club to get through to, yeah. rest, to help her. And he come out, stabbed him seven times. He was critically ill. No. The guy was a lunatic. Yeah, so this, they put me in the paper saying, oh, former lover, Jimmy Tippett Jr., uh, author of Born Gangster. But no, it's, and then obviously with all that happening, I thought, oh, my head was burnt out, Dodge. Wow. Uh, I thought like, I got to a stage where, hang on a minute, this roller coaster is fucking well and truly, mm. it's, it's stopped. Mm. And I've got, I've got to see, so I remember a friend of mine was really concerned about, I was really in a low, low really, mm. this girl hit me hard. So I went and saw a medium on FaceTime because it's COVID, no yeah. one wanted to see each other. Yeah. So she predicted my mum dying in her sleep of cancer. She predicted my uncle dying, who died three days later. I didn't, she went, go and see Bobby, go and see Bobby. I went, what do you mean Bobby? I don't know Bobby. My, my uncle Bobby Clark died three yeah. days later. So everything she predicted turned out right. Yeah. And I said, I feel that she's connected herself to me. Since I saw it, she was Catholic. So the, that, they opened, that, opened the, the coffin. So as we, I went to see her, her body, I, was just, I think COVID was still happening because you could only have so many yeah. people at the funeral. And it was like, I saw her and I thought she connected to me in such a way. Mm. I wanted to kill myself. I was taking sleeping tablets, like going out partying, sleeping tablets, just to, to do away. I wanted to do away with me. I didn't want to be alive. Yeah. And then the, the the medium said, listen, you've got to stop taking these blue tablets. Yeah. She, now she don't know nothing about me. I've not told her my name. She can't Google me. Yeah. She told me, listen, there's a girl in the corner of a room crying. She said, this girl can't cross over. Something happened to her, very traumatic. She doesn't know whether she's in this world or the next, but she needs to be in the other world. And I'm a very spiritual person now. I believe in the spiritual universe. Yeah. We're all made up of atoms. Yeah. I don't believe in Jesus and all that nonsense, but I believe there's something there and there's a, power, there's a powerful force there. And with this girl, obviously I went to her grave. I do, I'd done, the, the, the medium said, you need to say something very, very important to you. And I've got an, a boxing glove with my dad's ashes in, with part of my dad's ashes, yeah. in, the, in the clenched up in the fist. Yeah. I took some of those ashes out. I took a cigar, which had my DNA on it, a Givenchy t-shirt, what she loved, which she always tried to nick my Rottweiler Givenchy t-shirt. So I took it to the grave. I sprayed it in Creed, what she loved, the, the aftershave. I put my dad's ashes down what I put, saw a bit of a hole in the grave because it was all new, new, new soil. Put my cigar, said a Hail Mary, said a few bits and pieces I wanted to say. I walked out of uh, this gra gra it's, uh, graveyard in uh, in Wigan and it was like, I felt relieved. It was yeah. like a big weight off my shoulders. And it was like, I saw some, it, it was it was like quite a, a weird experience, mm. a surreal experience because I felt, and then obviously with the medium saying that about my mum, I didn't want to say nothing to my mum. And then my mum said to me, Jim, I, I need to talk to you. I've been diagnosed with terminal cancer. They said, I've got a year. But the, the medium had already told me this. Mm. And it was like, I, I told my mum, she went, nah, load of old poppycock, don't believe in that nonsense. Mm. But my mum ended up did dying on her sleep. She died in her sleep. Mm. So everything this woman said, she predicted, she said about a, a man called uh, Gareth in my life, she needs a grass, like that. And I thought, what? Who said that? This medium. medium okay. But I saw the woman, because yeah. I'm doing a FaceTime. And I said, what? We had this geezer Gareth hanging around us. He ended up, he knew the night I was in York. Yeah. So funny how it was all, when I started putting things, things. together, and then he would he would be one of those people trying to get into your girlfriend behind your back. Right. He couldn't hold his hands up. Absolute wet lettuce, yeah. absolute drip. It looks like young Kenneth Barlow out of yeah. Coronation Street. Yeah. But a right, a right mug, a right yeah. mug. One of those people go in the pub, he won't buy a drink, but you know, you'd be drinking a drink, you'll look around, he's got your drink in his hand. Yeah. You know, absolute yeah, yeah, yeah. loss. Yeah. But no, he was, uh, she predicted all that. She predicted about somebody else called Terry. She, she, it was like, and I, and I, and I, now I replay that. Mm. I've got an hour and a half what it was and I replay it and, and everything becomes clear. But at the time, my life was going really, really strange. But now, since my mum died, my whole life has gone for the better. Yeah. I've changed my life completely. I train every day. I'm back boxing. I used to do like my bag work, yeah. do light weights, do a lot of walking. 
I've got a beautiful home, I've got a nice car, I've got some really, really good friends, yeah. really good friends, good and you. a beautiful girlfriend, Paige, she's absolutely amazing. Yeah. She actually said to me the other week, she went, why don't you get off your ass and start doing these podcasts? <laughs> You've got books to write. And she said, because it, it, I don't want to see you wasting your life yeah. away. Yeah. So obviously, since you come to you come through to me, through our good friend Ray, yeah. and obviously things are really looking up. Yeah. I've been offered a part in a, in a well-known TV show, so I've got to go back for a second uh, screen test nice. and hopefully some acting lessons and hopefully a six month contract. Yeah, good for you. So man. things are going really, really well now. I want to roll back there, your mum. Yeah. You know, I lost my mum this year. <coughs> Cancer. It's the hardest she thing She didn't about. believe it and she didn't believe it. How old was she? Uh, 70. My mum was 73. Yeah, 70. Yeah. Uh, Too young. Playboy at Mayfair Casino. Was a pop my mum was a Playboy out. bunny. Yeah, so was mine. Yeah, yeah. You're joking no, me. I was doing to God. Oh, no, Playing so the was Playboy mine. Club. Yeah. Victor, Victor, Victor Lounge. Yeah. Victor Lounge, yeah. And my old man was a croupier. Yeah, my mum was a Playboy bunny. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, that was in the 60s. Wow. In the 60s. Yeah, 60s, 70s. Because they, they, they were like the sort and of... they were good like, looking. Yeah, they, they was like the, the lap dancers before. The classy lap dancers before. Time. But they wouldn't we do anything. Nothing. No, but no. They would just but, serve the Arabs drinks and the Arabs would pay But my mum did say a lot of the girls did go off with the Arabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But I had a whole year when. She got told she had six months and she didn't go down the chemo. She didn't believe it. She didn't want to do all that. This is like, this is what she was said. like, my mum's done like, it on her terms. Her on her terms. Yeah. That's what she did. And I had the most amazing year 12 months, 11 months, nothing was happening to my mum. And the last month, it went off the edge of a cliff. But I had the best 12 months of my life with my mum. That's what happened with me. Yeah. I moved back to my mum's. I, I looked year. after her. That was last year for me. It was a. Uh, 2021, I sort of I moved back to my mum's mm. and then we had a year together. Yeah. I used to cook for her, clean for her, do yeah. everything. She had carers come in, but she was one, she was still drinking Lauren Perry Rose. They still smoking up until the so last my day. Mum, mum was drinking she said, she said, Jim, curries. I don't want my hair to, yeah, no, my yeah. Said, they would, that's the worst thing for their stomach. Because yeah. mum had stomach cancer, riddled with cancer. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, no, 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 I, I want an Indian. I went, all right, mum, I'm going to get your pump for or whatever she wanted. She'd have her old PR, smoking her Bensons. Yeah. And she went and she said, you know, so, her terms. she said, but I've seen a change in you, Jimmy. You've, yeah. you've shown me that you're not selfish, that you care about mm. me, that you love me. I wake up in the morning, make her a cup of tea, you know, old country roses yeah. in a little cup and saucer, go and take the dogs out for a walk. I've done everything for her. And she was very, very, my mum my was very well to do. She, yeah. she had a lot of money and she looked after me. Mm. She was really, she, my sister on the other hand, turned to be very cold and very, I which I can't understand because she had a, my mum really looked after her. She had a. She everyone, the thing is, Jim, everyone reacts in a different way. Yeah, that's you right. You can't look at someone saying they should have done, they should have done. You be you. Do you know what it was? Me. That's what I was. Yeah. I loved me mum. Yeah. And do you know what it was? We become best mates in the end. Yeah. But losing my mum was 10 times harder than losing my dad. Mm. I didn't realise how much I loved her. So you lost your mum in 2021, you say? No, last year, 20, 2022. 2020. She died, But she found out she, a year before she had the terminal yeah, cancer. Same. So I moved back in 2021 to make her life easier. How was it for you when it was, you realised that time's up with a family member, like someone like your mum, who you've had maybe an up and down relationship with. I didn't want to accept it, last, first of all, Dodge. It, hear me out. Over the last 30 years, you've been up and down. She's ignored you. She's blocked you. She's seen the, the madness that you've created. Because you've created madness, what's going on. Yeah, been trouble and mayhem everywhere I went. Yeah, everywhere you went. And mm. that comes from the back of alcohol, drugs, birds, da -da, all that stuff, which is fine. Does, Everyone's yeah. lived their lifestyle. Yeah. There's no judge here. Did you feel that you really made peace with your mum in those last 12 months? 100%. We become really, really good friends. I used to take her out for a bit of breakfast. I'd take her down to her favourite restaurant near where she lived, Pia Luigi's. They all loved her. Yeah. She's a very generous lady, always tipped very big. Yeah, same. Uh, she, my mum yeah. loved the Lauren Perry Rose. She was very, she, I mean, she left a lot of financial gifts to her friends. Yeah. And she went, oh, don't, Jim, don't question that. I'll do what I want to do. Yeah. This and it's my, she said, oh, do you want me to stop? Do you want me to not give you anything? I went, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> carry on that bit. Yeah, carry on, mum. We'll forget <laughs> that. She went, but she was very witty, yeah. very charming. Yeah. Uh, Did you get to say everything you wanted to to your mum? Everything, everything. So there's nothing held back. Nothing held back. That's we spoke feeling, about right? everything. Do you know, yeah. This is why I think I can move forward in my life yeah. now, Dodge. And everything I've done now, I, she, when she said tough love, my daughter come to me not long ago. How old's your phone. daughter? My daughter's 21. Okay. Beautiful girl. She, her name's Maisie. And uh, she said, Dad, I'm with my nan. She went, oh, uh, can I have some money for a bed? She, I think she wanted a thousand pounds. And I said, the money was there, Dodge. I went, I started thinking, I thought, she's with her nan shopping for a bed. But my, she didn't come and see my mum, yeah. who's her other nan, yeah. for a year she was dying. Yeah. And I went, no, darling, sorry, ask your nan to buy it for you. Yeah. She went, what do you mean? I went, well, you couldn't see your nana. That's your nana's yeah. money. Who you couldn't come and see her in a year she was dying. Yeah. And she said, oh, dad, dad, dad. I went, no, it's called tough love, darling. Mm. And I felt a bit horrible doing it, but it was, I, but I thought what my mum My mum would you. have said that to me. Yeah. She said, well, well, don't think it, let her nan pay yeah. for it. She didn't come see me for a year. She couldn't. Why should she have some of my money? So me and my daughter now, we're, we're a little bit distant. Okay. 
But I know I'm, I'm still going to stick with what my mum said. Tough love. When she wants to come back, she can come back. Mm. Rolling further back, your old man passed, what, 2016? 2016. 2016. Tell me your last memories of your old man. Not good. Uh, he would been diagnosed at 80. It was his 80th birthday, which had a lovely birthday for him in Beckenham, in his local. Uh, but his best friend was there, Paul Moriarty, who played yeah. Hatchet Harry in Lockstock. Yeah. He was yeah, there. Yeah. He was, he was, he was my, best mate. That was my dad's best okay, mate. Cool. So he sent him his birthday card. It went to Jim. Uh, you always be my hero. Thank you for the last 60 years. Blah, blah, blah. The greatest memories ever. And it's lovely. And Paul speaks so highly yeah. of him. And uh, we had a lovely time. And then all of a sudden, one day he's had a stroke. And then he got to the hospital and had another four strokes. And then he was like, he, he was going, he, he, he couldn't went off his head. Yeah. Uh, so he was sectioned and put in a local, like, nut house. And obviously we were scanned up seeing him there. We was half, we was half laughing, to be honest, because yeah. it was, we was like, it was quite, it was like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. It was like, it was like something out we'd never seen. Then obviously he was diagnosed with, obviously, uh, dementia. Mm. And obviously we got in, we got him into a, uh, a nursing home in Bickley, yeah. which is just down the road from Bromley. But it was just, it, we, he was four years in there, Dodge. Was he four years, four years in Four years in there. And obviously we saw a lot of patients die. But the funny thing was, my uncle, Tom, who ended up marrying my dad's sister, he ended up being the next door neighbour to me, dad. They'd been friends for like 50 years. Mm. Did it well, more than that, 50, 60 years. Mm. They didn't even know each other. They didn't know. Didn't know each other. But my dad went, who's that guy? He's the next door. It's his brother-in-law. <laughs> I didn't know, but he ended up visiting him in the nut house yeah. and he ended up being in the same nursing so home. So when you, when you say nut house, what was, what was your old man like when he was in there? Very quiet. Yeah. He, it was like, he was, he was like, it wasn't him. It was like, it, it was like, it was like, we, we called it, look in his eyes sometimes, Dodge. It was like, lights was on no one's home. It was yeah. like, it was like, if he was an animal, we'd, we'd have, we'd have put him down if we could have done. Yeah. We'd have, we'd have given him an injection and put him to sleep. He would have hated it to see foreign people trying to yeah. take his trousers down, yeah. manhandle him to get him changed. And, and they could be very violent yeah. with dementia. Yeah. I understand they got to manhandle him. What's dementia like for a son? Does it, 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 I just tried to switch off to it. Don't get me wrong, I was living in Brighton, yeah. but I still come down twice a week to see my dad. Yeah. I'd visit him every week. And I had my cousins who- Did he recognise who you were? Every, this is the funny thing. Yeah. Every single time, he went, hello son, how you doing? I went, all right dad. He went, all right, and it he, would be quite funny. He went, you got any money on your son? I went, yeah, yeah, like, I'd give him, like, I used to get these tissues with like money on them. And I'd go, oh, yeah, dad, so, he went, oh, son, thanks for that, cheers. He said, I might want to go and have a drink. I went, yeah, no problem. I used to, I used to like play along <laughs> with it, Dodge. And then my mum was there one day, he went, she's nice looking, that girl there. And she went, that's your wife, you silly bastard. He went, what do you mean? I went, well, you've been married to her for 45 years. Yeah. He went, have I? He yeah. went, oh, she's nice, her, isn't she? My yeah. mum started crying. She went, you, you've been horrible and fucking all your fucking life. Yeah. And he knows who you are each and every time. Mm. I love him each and every day. Been with him all those years mm. and he doesn't even know who I am. So it was, we did have that special connection. Mm. And it was, uh, Dave, funny enough, Dave Courtney come to see him there. Uh, he had a lot of well-known faces come and see we him. We had Dave on the podcast last week, in fact. Yeah, Dave Dave, Dave yeah. was very close to my dad. Yeah, Dave, Dave, My dad was very friendly with Dave. He was very fond of funny. Dave. Funny, Dave's stories are funny. So funny. funny. When we used to go as kids, Dave was the head doorman at Limelight. Yeah. yeah. So he, uh, we used to, he used to, he used to be under a lot of pressure, I suppose, <laughs> letting us in. But uh, no, but yeah, no, he's, uh, he's gone his way. I've gone my way. But no, he's always been a character. Are you, are you pals of him? No, we, we know each other. Listen, yeah. do you know what it is? He's got his life. I've got my life. We, I don't. As he's, he's got his own shebang yeah. going on. I've got my own yeah. shebang going on. Yeah. He was a friend of my dad's. Yeah. So you've had an eventful life. <clears throat> Very eventful. But obviously now it's, it's gone. Re I'm. Are you feeling like you've turned a corner at the age of fifty? I feel that my mum said at 49, it's the first time in 49 years I can say I'm actually proud of you. Yeah. So now I've got some really good things in the fire. Good. I'm hoping to go into the acting world. Yeah. And I'm, I've got a few books in the pipeline. Just just on a roll back there, your mum says she was proud of you. For the first time in 49 years. How did that make you feel? Cried. Yeah. Because my mum was such a hard character. She had beautiful still blue eyes, but yeah. she looked at me and said, Jim, I'm gonna tell you something now, I'm actually proud of you. For the first time in 49 years, you come back, you've looked after me, you've not made one moan about it. Yeah. You get up every morning, do my tea, take the dogs out. She said, you haven't moaned once. She said, I, do, I am a bit of a tyrant. I do like expect yeah. you to do this and do that. She said, but no, for the first time, I'm actually really proud of you. Is there anything, if you turn back time with your old dear, that you wish you hadn't have done in those years that she wanted to give you hard love, tough love? I do dodge, but the thing is, I believe I didn't have your normal growing up. Yeah. I saw a lot of things which maybe other children didn't. Yeah. I saw police coming through like with bloody ropes on, climbing yeah. on walls with machine guns and ski masks, yeah. like terrorism cops. And my dad was involved with Asa Arafat, yeah. 
Mm. Uh, some very big heavy duty Saudi people. My dad was involved with Russell Buffalino mm. from the New York Mafia. Mm. There was a lot of things what my, I didn't, but when the police come, they come every duty. Yeah. Uh, but my dad always got off of it. Yeah. My dad was very clever at what he'd done. He provided us with a great, growing up is like a fairy tale. Mm. So me growing, going from a boy to a man was very hard. Yeah. So when I did actually, it, I didn't really like, I, I wanted to stay in that fairy tale. Yeah. And my, I thought my mum and dad lost a lot of money in the 90s and they had to move out of the big, we lived in a great big house in Keston, which yeah. was like the Beverly Hills of Kent. My mum and dad lost a lot of money and we moved into a smaller house, little cottage. And it was it was a hard transition. And then that's when I sort of got into the drugs and messing about when in reality, if, if my dad would have been a bit, bit more discipline, yeah. I think I'd have gone a long way in the boxing world. Yeah. Because I was very good at, I could bang, I could did bang. He want, did your old man want you to be a fighter? Because I would imagine your old man no. didn't want you to get in no. the naughty world. No, Joey Dunn, we're, I was good, I was good at knocking everyone out and things like that, I, I, but I didn't like training. I like, I like, I like to Party go, boy. I used to have a sunbed, go out there, <laughs> look good. And, and, my dad, and my dad took me up one day and he went, he went, son, he, he, when he went out in the big house one day, I got a brand new BMW there, I had my Rolex on, he went, son, get in your car. So he drive me down the old Kent Road. So we driven down to the, towards Elkent Road. We went up the Henry Cooper, which was owned by a Terry Teddy Haynes, my yeah. dad's mate. He was a like middleweight champion back in the day. So we went up there, and there was some young black kids there. They was over from whatever country they was in. They were sitting there skipping. It was four o'clock in the morning. There was a big puddle of sweat underneath them. They were banging the bag. My dad went, "Son, you're better than all them." He said, yeah. "You've got more. You've got more gift than your little finger." He said, "But son, they're dedicated." Yeah, they want he it. said, "They're there. They yeah. want it. They're hungry." Yeah. He said, "Son." You end up getting hurt by someone who ain't got the ability you've got or anything. He said, because you're not willing to train. Yeah. You've got everything they want. Did you find Did you find that you had <coughs> an old man who had a lot of money and your old dear and they'd done really well for themselves. Did you find that you were given things too easy? Far too easy. Yeah. Spoil, at the age of kid, if I wanted a motorbike, I had it. Okay. I, remember, I remember writing my Christmas presents down. Yeah. And I remember me saying, I was quite a fucker really, but I, I remember lifting the presents up, tearing them and looking what I had, write it down on the list. Put it, sellotape it back up, put it down. And my sister one day grasped me up to my mum and went, Mum, he's ruining Christmas, he's opening it. She went, you fucking... <laughs> See, she's got that, and she's throwing all the presents all over the house. And then she went, I thought it was a bit weird how you kept asking for these particular <laughs> presents. And I thought, how do you know that I haven't got that? And then, yeah. but no, she was a... She was a great mum. I think my dad would have been a she little sound, bit. You know what? After I'm hearing this, you sound like you've got a really good dad. Number one, you yeah. sound like you've got a proper solid mum. Mum, she was like, yeah, she was like the that. Violet Cray of like the. Because my dad always, he was, he was always. He was always there, but my dad was like- he He's a man's his, man, right? He was a man's man. He yeah. never cheated on his mum. Yeah. He, he, don't get me wrong, women found him very attractive. Yeah. He'd walk in somewhere, he had so much charisma and charm. He'd walk in, he had silver hair, piercing blue eyes. And the girl, he'd have his handmade suits on his pinky yeah. ring, his big gold Rolex. And women loved that. Yeah. He'd walk in and go, get some shit, get him on champagne, blah, blah, blah. And, and he had that bit of, Barbara Windsor was always flirting around him. I remember my mum in that horrible little poison dwarf. I ate her, I ate her, yeah, yeah. Because my mum was 20 years younger than my dad. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so she, my mum was like, oh, I can't be around those ugly old women. <laughs> yeah, so. And what's, what's the future old for you now? We're in 2022 now. Can um, I'm looking really to do some more books. Yeah. And obviously I want to dedicate a little bit on my dad's book. My dad wasn't a greedy person. Yeah. So I'm doing my dad's book. It's called The Real Deal. And I'm gonna- You say you're doing your dad's book. What, you, you getting someone to go for I'm doing it with, I'm doing it with, I'm doing it with a, uh, a writer called Julie Shaw, who's written 20 number one bestsellers. Oh, wow. So she's from the Northern underworld. So she's from Bradford originally. So she's doing the book with me. We're gonna do it with like my dad's friends who are still alive. And yeah. I've got some friends who died have left, because I was doing it for a few years. And they, they write, they're writing their stories how they met my dad. And obviously I'll write about his boxing story and about my story with my dad. Then obviously what I want to do is, uh, put all the royalties over to dementia and cancer. Cause my dad wasn't a greedy man. Mm. He wouldn't want, he, wouldn't, he would, my dad would give rather than receive. Yeah. So I want to give something back. Yeah. And maybe, and, and tell people my story with my dad with dementia. Mm. Cause like, dementia is a very, very bad illness. Very bad, that's why I asked that question. What was it like for you? It's bad for the, 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 Dodge, the adult or it, whatever. It was, uh, it was heartbreaking. I used yeah. to walk away there some days in tears. Yeah, I bet. And you know, so I used to walk out of there and I remember my mum would be there. She'd drop me back to the station. I'd get, I'd get a tram over to Beck, uh, to East Croydon. And on the train back to Brighton, I'd phone my mates. I'd go, where are you? I'd go, and I'd go and get a couple of tickets and go and get on it. Yeah. Because that was my way of dealing with yeah. it. It would blank it out. So for me, those years living in Brighton was going out, getting wankered and drunk mm. and, and, and out of it was because of what I was going through on a mm. daily basis with my dad with dementia. Would you ever look at doing like a going to NA, AA or anything. Did you ever look at that? I'm did you ever no, look at do the 12 steps or did you to ever be on, to be honest, with, To be yeah. honest, I'm going through all this at the moment. You are. Right. I'm actually really wanting to, to I'm, I've actually spoken to the relevant yeah, people okay. and I will be doing that in the next few weeks because it's, does the, I time, don't, does the time feel right to do it? 
the Flute Time feels exactly right for yeah. it because obviously the BBC studios have phoned up and yeah. they're very, very serious about the offer they've made me on a, yeah. on a, on a, on a programme. I can't yeah. say too much at the moment because it's non-disclosure agreements. Yeah. But obviously I, they wouldn't want me drinking. I would be drug tested regularly. Yeah. Uh, and I don't enjoy drinking anymore if I'm on yeah. Dodge. Yeah. I get, I've got to a stage where... Well, you've parted out. I, I know <laughs> I've parted out. Yeah. I, I enjoy a glass of wine yeah. over dinner. Yeah. And but now I don't think to think of sitting up in a kitchen talking absolute no. bollocks till next next morning yeah. till the birds yeah. tweeting. Horrible. That that is that yeah. that, that that feels like oh, get it's it your twenties and thirties really like yeah not your fault. And I've got 50s, a lot of friends. So, yeah. who, I mean, my girlfriend's in her twenties, but it's it's not that. And I and I hold I'm on, not, hold on, hold on, hold on. What you're fifty on? You got a girl who's in yeah, the twenty three, twenty three, twenty three. Yeah, Paige. Yeah, <laughs> the, the blonde girl I showed yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, but no, she. But we get on brilliant. Yeah. But she's had a she's had a, an incredible life. Yeah. But she's, is she going through the party? Is she going through the party years now. She doesn't like it. She don't like it. She's gone the other she's way. She's done it. She's done. It. She was. She was in. A, she was living in a hostel when she was fourteen. Yeah. Fell out. Of the, she's had a very hard life. Okay. Very, very. She does what she wants when she was very grown up. But my mum, funny enough, when my mum and dad met, my mum was twenty three. Yeah. When she met my dad, yeah. who was in his forties. Yeah. So it's very similar. It's quite yeah. a story, and she looks similar to my mum. But no, she's she won't t tolerate any nonsense. Mm. She's like, I will wake up in the sleep. She wake she wake me up. Go, you just mentioned the girl's name in sleep. I'll be fucking. You know? <laughs> well, I can't even sleep about getting told off. <laughs> but no, she's a funny fucker. She really is. She 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 makes me smile. Yeah. And for me, I feel even if she wants to do what she wants, she can. But I want to be there to always pick up the pieces. Yeah. I feel that it, she's been sent back by my mum and dad to, yeah. to teach me a lesson. Did but, you find? Have you found that the girl you've met now is she the girl of your dreams? You're gonna stay for the rest of your life? Do you know something? Each and every, I take every day as it comes. Yeah. I could drop dead of an heart attack. I could die of cancer. Yeah. So now I live each day to the full. Mm. I mean, I leave this interview today. I'll be back in London. We'll be going out to Chinatown this evening for a nice meal. Having some fun. Having some fun. Go back home. I'm not going out drinking. Just going to have a nice meal yeah. late at night because she's working tonight. Have you found that she's calmed you down? She's made. She's the one who told me to do the podcast. She said, yeah. look, you've got so many good stories to tell. There, you man. need to get it out there. Yeah. She said, because you're sitting indoors, you're spending your inheritance, you're not putting nothing back into the pie. Yeah. Since I've done the first few podcasts and you got in mm. touch, Dodge, I've had loads of offers come out. Yeah. I've had GQ, Lads Bible, yeah. all wanting to do stories and things. Yeah. Yeah. So then, <clears throat> obviously, it is about putting your media situation out there. Mm. Jimmy, I've really enjoyed this interview. Thank you, Dodge. Me too. Mate, I've really enjoyed it. Thank it's you. It's like a lot of you've gone, we've gone deep here. Yeah. Uh, it's not your normal interview. We've gone deep. It's not about the crime. No. It's been through yeah. about my feelings and emotions, yeah, which to me is a better interview. Absolutely. And I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for honesty. Thanks for coming, Lloyd, Thank down you, in Dodge. the studio. Thank Just you. Just before we finish up, have you got any last words you'd like to say to your mum and dad? I'm sorry. And that I want to now, everything I do on a daily basis, if they're looking down, I want them to smile and be, be proud of my achievements. Mate, that's lovely, mate. Thank Quality. you. Nice one, God Jimmy. bless. Thanks, Cheers, mate. Thank you. Nice God one, bless. Mate. Thank you.